people. So beyond the action log, let's deal with that first. Lisa, anything you want to highlight with the action log? Obviously, you've still got the red one outstanding. Anything else you want to comment on? So all the others that are in progress we'll touch upon in the meeting. Um, it's mainly with regards to participation on the groups that we have that we don't have a patient voice on. And with regards to the one that's outstanding in red, um, Victoria's actually been away from the team for a couple of months, um, but we do have one of her colleagues representing some data a little bit later on in the meeting. And obviously it's a, a key element that we want to share with the PPG going forward. Um, so other than that, I think everything's OK. Oh, OK, thank you. Can we move on then to the minutes then? Uh, anything in the minutes? Sorry, I see a hand up there. Peter, you? Yes, yes, uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, are, are you ready to take comments on this action log, um, William? Oh, yes, please, please comment. Yes, certainly. Yes, please do. Item, item, 30, uh, item 31, uh, right. no expressions of interest in the breast cancer, um, the breast CAG. Yeah. Um, what are, as as a um, you know as an elderly um, as an elderly um, uh, male patient having lots of um, hormone treatment, I would I recommend um, approaching sh sh the National Shine Group because they they should have lots of um, really good um, breast cancer survivors, and I hope that at a national level they can um, you know they can help all of the um, all of the cancer alliances to find suitable people if if they can't be found any other way. OK, thank you. That, that's yep. very helpful. I'm sure Lisa will take a note of that. Uh, yep. can, I yes, can, I can, can I continue, William? Yes, please so, do. Yeah, item 32, um, yep. you know, how, how to do a um, how to do a um, questionnaire on how the service is perceived. My suggestion is three highlights and three lowlights. And just leave it at that. Item 33. Um, Obviously, Lisa's had a disappointing um, uh, lack of reaction to her list of themes. I think it's excellent, and I think it's a great starting point for um, speakers for 2023. You know, the Royal Arts has Mark Fulkes. Um, Oxford has um, the um, you know uh, the former hard worker um, Jeremy Crew, and you know the um, apart from um, and then there's Anant Dev to talk about the GP point of view, and obviously you know you've got an excellent um, team like Lisa at the sure. Cancer Alliance. So I, I would suggest that you've got um, a great Let's list of speakers speak. for years to come. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks very much, Peter. Andrew, you want to come in? Yeah. Um, yeah I, that was when you asked about the minutes. That was, oh, so sorry. Can... Okay, I'll go on to the minutes now. Nothing else on this. Okay, minutes, um, Andrew. Yes. Yeah, I was just going to say I, I did convey my apologies for missing the last meeting, oh, but right, that okay. didn't end up in minutes. But okay. okay, sorry about that. Minor. Make sure those are recorded then. Okay. Um, if I can just raise one thing following the minutes. You remember we spent uh, some time last meeting talking about uh, the various acronyms: the the ICS, the ICB, the ICP, and etc. <laughs> uh, um, you know, trying to kind of understand the relationship with the new with the new system. I just want to uh, highlight for people that the the ICP, which is the, the partnership board, which is essentially health and uh, um, local authorities uh, working together jointly, whereas the ICP is the uh, uh, the health uh, structure uh, board. The ICP is responsible for producing a strategy um, for the whole of the ICS. Uh, there's been a lot of work going on about that, and it's just about to be produced in draft form. There's a consultation starting from the 12th of December, going through the 29th of January. And it's, I mean, it's obviously very generic because it's talking about a whole range of uh, subjects, uh, not just um, condition specific. I would certainly urge anyone who's interested to uh, get hold of a copy and feel free to comment. Um, and, you know, hopefully you might have a, a, an opportunity if you think it's appropriate to share it with any local groups that you're involved in. So the, the key contact uh, is what I have at the moment is Robert. Bowen, B-O-W-E-N. Robert. <laughs> This is, the, this, is, this is the email address. 
So it's robert.bowen, B-O-W-E-N, at nhs.net. He's the lead person who's been, been involved with the, the discussions and the, and the drafting. I'm not sure what the, what the kind of various uh, uh, um, processes are going to be involved, but I think yeah. anyone's, if anyone's interested, please contact Rob. Okay. William, yeah, William, I was going to say, sorry, I've just come off a phone call from Rob actually talking about the cancer strategy. Oh, right, great. <laughs> and, and the details. So he's expecting some sort of detail from us. Well, he wanted by the 16th of December, but I said, actually, we're not having our workshop with our, our clinical teams and hopefully we'll be able to invite some of the um, patient representatives to it on the 22nd of December, which I know is very late. Um, so he's given us an extension <coughs> to the of January to get a version through. But if you like, I'm happy to sit put his email address and number in the chat for others to contact and right, through Lisa, right. and through Lisa will invite um you know representation from your group here today um come along on the 22nd if that's if that's okay that'd be really helpful that's, that's great thanks thanks Kathy I know, Thank I know I know Rob is very keen to get as many responses as possible and you know having spent quite a lot of time talking to, to Java Khan the, the chair of the ICP he's certainly very keen to particularly have uh, um, you know, uh, voluntary organisations and uh, service users involved in directly commenting. I mean, it's going to be a, it's not the, the shortest of documents, uh, but I think, you know, please, please do have a look at it. And if you think you can make a, a contribution, please do. OK, uh, that takes us on turn then to the executive board update. Can we move on to those slides, uh, that slide? OK, so uh, October it seemed like a, seemed like an awful long time ago. Um, the, the main item on the agenda was how does how do we recover from all this, all this sort of challenge of the, of the pandemic? Um, the discussion focusing very much on 62 day waits, on 104 day waits, and on the expected trajectory by uh, 2023. Can we move on to the next slide, please. So this is just an example of the kind of issues that were uh, discussed. Concerns about the lack of progress on kind of mitigation of the problems that were being faced. <laughs> Interesting picture there of an, of an igloo. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Uh, real, I think some trusts were reporting challenges on having the capacity to do uh, imaging. And, and clearly the, the 104 plus was uh, uh, higher than expected. Uh, now, there was a lot of sort of detailed discussion about that. And I, I missed part of that discussion because I was in an earlier meeting. So um, I don't know whether uh, uh, Lindell or, or Cathy would just like to kind of um, come in on, on sort of any contributions you'd like to make around that that discussion, if you can remember that far back. So the the discussion around the the, the, um, the challenge. Executive. Yeah, in so so in terms of so in terms of just the challenges, just for people um, to be aware. So we did have um, one of our trusts, um, Buckinghamshire Hospital, in Tier One of um, the sort of in, which is part of the sort of cancer performance, which is our sort of worst performing. You know, um, which, which is for basically for worst performing trusts in in, in the country, um, and it's it's based on the size of their backlog as a proportion over their whole of their waiting list. And at that, at that <coughs> Buckinghamshire were at a sixteen percent backlog position, um, but we've done quite a lot of work with them. They've been doing loads of work, and they've got a massive improvement plan. And actually, we've we've improved that position quite a lot. So they're now down at eleven percent. So they've actually moved out of tier one, which is really good news. Um, and they've been you know treating and sorting all those patients over 62 days. But what we're finding is when we go in and spend some time with them, actually a number of these 62 day pathways that are open on the on the PTL as it were, um, are just waiting for you know letters to be sent to um, patients or GPs before they're closed. But actually the treatment's being done, they're often benign, um, but until they've had that confirmation histopathology or that confirmation letter, the, the, the trackers can't take them off, as you're probably aware. And I hope that I'm not giving too much information that's, that's too detailed. But um, but so that's really good news. 
um, and um, so they're, they're going definitely in the right direction, but we've still got work that we're doing with them. So we were meeting them on a weekly basis, both TPCA and the regional colleagues uh, with their coup and various other improvement parts of their team that's now gone to buy as of this week actually that's gone to bi-weekly meetings um but we're looking at unfortunately as we've sort of sorted out one area um our our uh, uh, performance at the Royal Berkshire has um deteriorated so we're now looking at working with them and again a lot of their um backlog position is um a, a fairly significant proportion of their patients are waiting for their histopathology report to come back formally um for their pathway to be closed but they the patients have been told they've not well no actually the patients are still sitting on the waiting list until after that histopathology report comes back so we're working with them about how we can do that royal berkshire have got particular challenges at the moment they've got 50 percent vacancies in their pathology team um and we're looking at how we can support them through the pathology network uh, and they're linking up with Oxford and they're also looking at outsourcing. They just had a, a, a you know, a significant um, reduction of, of staff due to sort of retirement and people moving on. So they are struggling with that. But the, the whole of the organisation is focused on it and, and, and working to try and um, resolve that as much as as much as they can. So that detail wasn't discussed at the exec board in, in that much detail. But we've been working behind the scenes with the trust to try and understand where they are um, with their performance and trying to support them um, going forward. OK, thanks, Cathy. I think that's uh, some helpful examples there of the kind of work that's being done behind in order to kind of you know, deal with it. Here's a summary of the agreed actions. Clearly, there is there is a, a lot to be done in terms of improvement. Cathy's talked a bit about some of those and to look at, you know, sharing any learning across uh, the Alliance in terms of, you know, what, uh, what's working well in particular trust and what could work better in others. Um, Clearly, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of the weights. Uh, there was a highlight a particular need for a uh, focus on, on the urology and skin pathways. Uh, and then um, the executive chair, Magana, agreed that she would raise any relevant issues at a regional and national level. So we're trying to take this at a, you know, a number of different tiers, you know, uh, both working with the trusts and then looking at whether or not uh, things needed to be escalate it. Um, Linda, anything you want to add about this? I think Kathy's given the helpful update, William, so there was nothing else um, in particular to, to raise. Thank you. OK, thanks very much then. Just move on to the next. OK, <clears throat> um, I did a, a presentation uh, at the executive highlighting some of the kind of themes that you would expect from me in terms of, you know, the importance of co-production, etc. Uh, but what you've what I've highlighted here is what were the uh, what were the key themes coming out of the survey? The most important thing that you that I can reinforce again and again um, sounds a bit like the old Tony Blair thing, education, 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 communication, communication, communication. That was at the at the core of an enormous number of uh, responses from um, from people who completed the survey. Um, there was a number of kind of concerns expressed about negative experiences with both the GP practices and with hospital staff. And frankly, again, a lot of that had to do with uh, with with communication not being not being sort of communicated with enough or when they were communicated, not understanding or um, 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 organisations and people not listening, all the stuff associated around that. Waiting times, of course, uh, absolutely classic, you know, that that just keeps keeps going. Uh, and we've already sort of highlighted earlier just the kind of uh, the problems that the system is facing in, in terms of dealing, dealing with that. Um, there was also the inevitable thing, which isn't mentioned here, but I'll just throw it in the park in passing. Uh, parking, we all know that you know parking continues to be an issue at, on every hospital site. Um, coordination of cancer care, again, I think that's self-explanatory. It's about the whole kind of thing about you know clearly if we're in the situation where we have a a complex condition and we're working with a number of specialties that isn't always as coordinated as well as it uh, as it should be. 
And then there were a range of, of wider hospitals issues, one of which I've just mentioned, which is which is the uh, which is the parking. Um, and again, there was the whole kind of issue about the the communication between uh, different uh, hospitals. If one was in the situation where you were dealing with more than one institution, again, yeah. communication was an issue. So this is what the fo the, uh, the presentation focused on. Uh, and there was the second one there, Heart Trust responding to the findings. We went through in a little detail what we knew at that point in time in terms of what each of the three trusts were, uh, how, how, how they had uh, done their initial analysis of the findings. And there was quite a, there was quite a variation uh, in, in that. Uh, in terms of the executive board response, just move on to the next slide. All right. So this is, so, sorry, I'm getting a bit, bit of fears there. Um, so essentially, in summary, what, what I was doing is asking the board for these these three things for an, you know, an endorsement of our voices and, and the, the importance of that being incorporated into um, action plans and improvements. That comes right back to the co-design and co-production issue. Uh, and then very much looking at how can we ensure that there is a, a clearer and a, a better working together of secondary and primary care, and then asking very much for an endorsement of the importance of embedding um, co-design and co-production in service development and delivery. So this is what was agreed. Uh, I thought it was a very thorough presentation. Uh, I don't know uh, whether, you know, uh, I, I probably didn't do as well as I thought I should have, but I think we're often in that kind of situation, feeling that we self-critical, we could have done better. But I think the important thing is the action, which is the managing director, which is Kathy, <laughs> presenting regular reports, because I think it's all very well doing a presentation and, you know, people engaging with it. But unless there's kind of a regular feedback uh, in terms of what's happening and monitoring it, I think it's, it's very easy for the the impact of what's being said uh, to be lost. OK, I've got a, a few hands uh, coming up. Patrick, I think you were first. Uh, yeah, thanks for that, William. It just relates back to uh, the, the, the previous issue, actually, and I just wanted oh, sorry. If there'd been any impact of community diagnostic centres in the region, in particularly in terms of reducing the uh, number of percentage of people, you know, not receiving treatment within the targets. Okay, uh, Kathy, is that something you're able to answer? Yeah. yeah, I can pick that up. Thank you, Patrick. So yes, we've had greater access to diagnostic support. So we've got various facilities. So for example, in the Bucks area, we've got the Cressex Centre in Oxford, we've got the Oxford CDC and Berkshire have got some. So there's definitely increased um, access to diagnostics, uh, especially around imaging, around MRI, CT, etc. Our biggest problem is um, is, is sometimes the time it takes for the um, diagnostic report to come back to us in terms of, you know, the actual readout of that message. There's still sort of, you know, delays, whatever, you know, um, shortages in, in that area. But um, but also that, you know, one of our biggest areas for, um, again, some of our sort of closing our pathways and, and, and moving patients to the next level of their in their journey is around pathology, as I sort of said, which all links into, for example, with the Royal Berkshire not having enough pathologists to support. Again, it's the it's not necessarily taking the biopsy; it's the actual, you know, doing the analysis of that biopsy and sending the results back uh, to the, you know, the referring clinician. So it has helped for sure as a short answer, um, but there are still restrictions in terms of, you know. Um, availability of that resource and, and the funding of that resource and it not being available, you know, seven days a week, etc. And, and and some of that, as people will know, where we have tried to get um, an independent uh, organisation to come in, for example, like in health, um, you know, to help with our sort of targeted health lung check, we've been really clear about them 
providing their own staff to do that so they're not actually taken away from the existing staff within the organization um who then may work for them and then you know we have less capacity elsewhere so we're we're working with the independent sector to try and support that um, and make sure that doesn't you know we don't have unintended consequences um by bringing them in in the first place right thanks very much okay, okay. uh uh peter is this one you want to come in on Yes, thank you, William. The, the, um, regarding the uh, patient survey and negative yep. um, GP experiences, my, um, my, uh, my GPs regularly score five and the receptionists regularly score one, in spite of actually I consider a much improved service. The, um, so overall 1.9, I'm, I'm very pleased to, um, you know, we, wrote, we recorded in the minutes of our last meeting that people are working incredibly hard. And I'm very pleased to hear Kathy um, is well on top of the explanations for that. So um, all I can, you know, I, I personally think, you know, please hang on in there, folks. Do the great work you're doing, and um, and you know, these, you know, don't worry too much about silly um, silly guidelines from the government. The, they're the ones that are underperforming in recent months. Well, thank you for that, Peter. Unfortunately, silly guide guidelines often have to, you know, have some adherence to, uh, despite what we might think. Uh, uh, Kath, you want to come in? Yeah, hi. Um, I wanted to just mention about the path labs and the, the capacity or lack of it at the Royal Barks. Is there not a national capacity, I don't know, um document or thing that comes out regularly that actually will tell you where there could be capacity because you can't just invent a histopathologist as we all know um <laughs> so is there anything like that that you can draw upon in other parts of the country or is it flat out <laughs> everywhere else so so uh, sorry yeah, so William, that's what I sort of alluded to earlier. So we have got something called um, pathology networks, which are local areas um, which come together. So within the southeast region, there are five pathology networks, to my knowledge. Um, Oxford sit in um, pathology south four, and um, Royal Berkshire sit in pathology south three or something like that. But to answer your question, um, the, um, the Royal Berkshire have contacted Oxford, and Oxford are able to help them in certain areas. But some of the some of the histopathology work is so expert; um, it requires certain levels of expertise that they haven't got extra capacity for. So we have reached out, and where we can, where we can outsource to a um, an independent sector or private provider, we're looking at doing that. In fact, William was at the session we had yesterday in Oxford where we had the um, clinical director for pathology at Oxford at that session talking about um, the issues around waiting times, backlog um, and, and support. Um, so yeah, so we are we are on to that but of course everyone is struggling and haven't got a lot of capacity but they are offering some additional support to Royal Berkshire but it's not enough to cover all the you know all the issues they've got but but you know Royal Berkshire have gone out to advert I think they're processing all of those applications etc so they, there's work going on it's just it, at the moment it is a bit it is a, a significant bottleneck for them which they are addressing. And it, and can I ask is it solely then you look within your region you wouldn't go to uh, your north of England to look for capacity or is it just within that region? Well, at the moment we're looking. I mean, uh, you'll get into technical things because, of course, if we're sending specimens away, they've got to, you know, be dealt with in a certain amount of time. They've got to be, you know, kept in a certain temperature, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the readings you could do at a greater national level, so you could actually have someone, you know, doing some of the work that actually, well, that's probably Im imaging more, isn't it? Because you can have your you can have your image taken in Scotland, but you can have someone in London, you know, reading the actual. Yeah. Uh, Result, but it, I don't know if it works quite like that with pathology because obviously there's a, a an actual specimen that's you know being sliced and diced and going yeah. through a piece of kit, kit etc. Yes. Um, you know what we did here yesterday is that Oxford have got the most, um, which is really impressive, have the most highest tech digitally connected um, uh, innovative laboratory anywhere in in, in the UK. Um, so, you know, and, and they are supporting as much as as they can. Okay, thanks, Cathy. Uh, uh, Linda, do you want to come in on this one? Clip, 
Yeah, could I just comment on the back of what Kathy has said? One of the other comments that uh, Dr. Roskill commented about yesterday is actually the importance of the clinical team and that engagement and where it's kept in house or locally. Teams can have conversations about um, a patient and that's really important. It's not just about looking at a slide and mm -hmm. making a diagnosis, but there's often clinical context that needs to be considered as you're sort of making a decision on something. So whilst there may be pressure um, within the system, I think it's important to remember that actually we want to have a quality service as well. And there may then be a little bit of a delay, but you've got the right people involved in that. Um, discussion. Okay. okay yeah, I, 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 yeah, I do understand that because I was a medical technician, so I did do histology. It's yeah. just you can't just conjure them up. I think that's where I'm more coming from, and you can't outsource it to somebody who doesn't back to work. Then, do any... pardon? Can we ask a please now? Can you come back to work? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm retired. Okay. okay. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> like, I, was a, uh, I, was a, I was a microbiologist. I did some histology, but I was mainly a microbiologist. Oh, okay. Anyway. OK, thank you. Mark, you've been holding on for a while. Is there this, this one you want to comment on? Yeah, I should do, since I work at the Royal Barts, yeah. So um, <laughs> right, it's okay. interesting to see the discussion go past. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of issues. Pathology is indeed our, our major issue in terms of capacity. There's big delays. Um, we've put a lot of resource into it. And the, the other thing to say, which is pertinent to what Lyndall just said, of course, is that ours is one of those pathology services that has been outsourced. So we we don't manage the service. So that adds an extra layer of complexity to managing uh, managing the service because it's a number of hospitals. It's like a consortium provided sort of BSPS is like a like a Berkshire wide pathology service. So so uh, so we don't control them. So it's it's led to a number of issues, but we're working really hard to help them sort of. Yeah, we've sent a lot of lot of specimens out to be outsourced so that has problems of its own but there's fundamentally enough bums not enough bums on seats across the uk with uh, as uh kath sounds uh, speaks like she uh, uh, has some experience of this and absolutely if you short a pathology they don't just grow on trees you can't go and pick them so uh, so yeah so it's it's slowly improving but it's it's going to take a while to get back on it and of course a lot of our pathways are entirely entirely reliant on pathology to report so uh so yeah so it's meant to meant sort of delays across our pathways just on that basis so yeah it's a, it's a big old problem okay thanks mark uh vicky hi yeah i'm vicky i'm from the um the cancer manager from bob um i just wanted to update on the the point you made about the link between primary care and secondary care right so we've just um employed four nurses across um, Oxford and Bucks. There's already one in place in Swindon and there's one just been appointed in Berkshire West and their prime role is to work between secondary and primary care. Specifically, their first brief is to look at cancer care reviews, the number of and, and more importantly, the quality of those cancer care reviews within the GP practice. So they will actually be in the new year reaching out to every um, GP practice across the Thames Valley um, and actually setting up those links and working with the practices. So I just wanted to put that in there for you so you know what's going on between secondary and primary care in that okay. area. Okay, thanks, Vicky. Does anyone else want to make any comments on the uh, on, on the survey, on the, the key things that are coming out? Or you feel we'll cover that. Uh, Alex? Hey there, Alex. To unmute. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yeah, 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 yeah. OK, yeah. just following up on that point that Vicky made. Um, as you know, I represent the uh, the the seven prostate cancer groups in, in our patch. And usually when I ask them for input to these meetings or ask questions of them after these meetings, uh, I usually get next to no response. But we recently discussed whether patients were happier uh, with their post treatment follow-ups being done at secondary level or primary level and I got an astonishing response um, from nearly all of the groups uh, with a very very strong preference for follow-ups to be retained by secondary care and not passed back to primary care. Right, right. Um, uh, it was a very strong response and the patient view is clear. That's and that, all and that is what is going to happen gonna with happen the prostate, prostate pathway? pathway? Good. 
Okay, thank you. I think that's a very, very, very important point. Uh, Andrew? Yeah, there, there are a couple. Um, I, I know a couple of areas have decided that certainly on, on things like the prostate referrals, it, it's never going to work properly through GPs in, in the current circumstance because of the issues of, of GPs, uh, you know, men coming to GPs to get to, you know, in, in the first place. And uh, a couple of the trusts have set up um, alternatives whereby you can get referred without going through your GP. So Southampton is now doing that men can actually email the hospital directly and get PSA test via the hospital without going through GP. Um, and one of the other uh, cancer alliances, and I can't remember which one it is, is now doing PSA test by post, but I can dig that out if you like. And again, that's direct referral to hospital without going through GP. Okay. So okay, that, thank you. that might be of interest. Okay, thank you very much. Anyone got any other comments or, or questions on, on this item or the, or the uh, performance one? OK, then let, let, let's kind of move on. Can we move back to the. The PowerPoint. Uh, the so next agenda item, William, is the data overview. Yeah, so Nathan, I believe, has joined us from right, our yeah, WADA team. Um, and so I'm giving the control over to him if he wishes to share anything with you guys. OK, thanks, Nathan. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, my name is Nathan. I'm the new data cancer um, analyst in the TVCA. Um, so I'm, I don't have a lot of data to share, but I do have a couple of slides just to show you um, the performance update. So um, I've been made aware, so this is my first time attending this meeting, but I've been made aware that previously you were showing some data, um, some performance standards um, as of March 2022, and that you wanted to also have a comparison for, you know, maybe the next six months to see um, any changes that has been made. Um, so I've looked back at um, the data from March and compared it with September 2022. Um, as you can see here, um, at, in March we were not hitting our uh, performance targets for um, majority of the uh, cancer waiting time standards and unfortunately um, due to probably a lot of the issues Kathy has already mentioned, uh, we have sorry fallen short a bit further with some of these standards as well um so i think for me looking at the data one of the key drivers for the reasons why we're not achieving those targets has been uh, there's been an, a huge increase in um referrals this year um compared to last year so i don't actually have the data going back to to compare with pre-pandemic levels but i'm looking into doing that but as you can see in this slide, this is just for the um, two week total two week wait patients seen. Uh, the blue line is uh, last year and the green line is for this year. So as you can see, the trend is quite, there's quite an obvious seasonality in the referrals and of patients being seen, but you can see that there's definitely been an increase, which is averages about 16% over uh, the year. And this as well feeds into the amount of breaches that have been seen on that two week wait pathway as well. And we can see that there was definitely a sticking point uh, sometime in June this year. And now the gap is growing um, quite a lot. But I will what I do want to point out that um, sorry, this validated data only goes back to September. And I know that um, off the back of the issues that we've been facing through June, July and August, there's been a lot of work put in um, since then to improve these uh, performances. It just hasn't come through on the data yet. Um, so following that um, going forward, I just wanted to ask if um, anybody would like to clarify or um, indicate what sort of data you'd be looking at next time, because I sort of just cobbled this together um, in a short space of time, but um, I am realised that the data is quite important. So if you would like any key points to highlight for the next time, I'll be able to provide that. OK, thanks, Nathan. Uh, Kathy, you want to come in? Yeah, it might be certain. Thank you, Nathan, for sharing that. I mean, what might be really helpful is to have, because we have got 
loads of data, but it's about data that's meaningful for you. So I don't know whether it would be a worth not in this meeting now, obviously, um, William, but for someone or, or representation working with Lisa and Nathan in terms of how you want data presented, because we can present it in many yeah. different ways. We've got it, so it's not like we're doing extra work, but we can just cut it and paste it in a way that's more meaningful um, for, for yourself. So if someone wants to take that as an action offline with Nathan and Lisa and one other, then then potentially that could be a suggestion of, of what we could we could look at doing, if that's helpful. No, I think it is, and uh, I mean, th thanks again to Nathan because no, you know, this is the first time you've been doing this, and you know, it's a, you know, obviously, it's, we need to kind of learn and understand what what do we what do we need to know. So, um, uh, Linda, I think you and want William, to. William, what's available? What we, you know, we could, someone could go through with, you know, Nathan and ourselves could go through with your team to say what is available, and then you can say, well, we only actually need to understand this, this, and this, so we could help streamline it as well for you. OK, thank you. I think I think the, the sort of link between Lisa and, and Nathan and we can we can sort out who else might be involved with that. So, Andrew, you want to come in? Yeah, the, the data that I'm most often after um, when I'm trying to sort of work out various things is, is where are we versus pre pandemic? In other words, are, are we back to the pre pandemic yes. referral rates, given that they should be the same because you know the rate that cancers appear or don't appear should not be affected by the pandemic? Um, and uh, also how many have we lost during the pandemic? Although we might be back to the pre-pandemic level, there was also a big dip during the pandemic and, and therefore, you know, how many are we still missing that we haven't found during the pandemic? But those are two key things that crop up an awful lot in, in the analysis that I, I try and do for people. OK, thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Linda? Just to say thank you to Nathan for stepping in and doing this. It's been really helpful. I think going forward, um, Victoria had previously shared the dashboard and I think we don't want to make this difficult, Nathan, for you. So just being able to bring the dashboard up and then potentially look at the key standards and then that would help with actually demonstrating that We've actually have we have seen an increase in activity and referrals, but also an increase in treatment numbers, which is really important that actually all of the trusts are treating yeah. many more patients than what they had been doing previously. So when you're talking about pre-pandemic activity, yes, we are seeing an increase in um, referrals. We're also seeing more treatments being given. Um, everywhere but also remember year on year uh, we're never going to go back to pre-pandemic level really because year on year we normally see a five to six percent increase across every trust anyway with activity for two week wait and treatment so there's always going to be a a, a change in activity okay thanks Linda. Kath I think we've looked at it before and it may be the dashboard that you're referring to is to know by the like the top 10 cancers where we're placed at the moment because some of the some of the um a month to treatment um some blood cancer patients which i tend to represent would be uh, dead so it <laughs> it yes. might be quite it might be quite useful to see perhaps by some specific disease the cancer um, um diagnoses uh, rather than just a blanket across the board. But that might be in the dashboard that I can piece together anyway. Thank you. Yeah, the, the dashboard does go by a tumour site per trust and we can do it across the whole of the South East region. So that, that is all, all available. Thank you. OK, thanks, Mark. Yeah, I think that's an interesting question that, and, that Andrew raised because there's, there's two actual, there's quite two interesting bits of data that Andrew referred to there. One is the, is the referral rates uh, into two-week wait. And what we saw immediately sort of during the pandemic, those plummeted down to a sort of a very low level uh, and then recovered where pretty much all of the all of the two week wait referrals we get in those urgent referrals are now considerably above the the the, the pre pandemic rate. Uh, the, the slowest um, the slowest tumor group to recover was indeed uh, a, a prostate. So men with prostate cancer were the slowest to recover, but even now they've recovered to the point where they exceed the pre-pandemic levels, if that helps you, Andrew. But it did take a lot longer uh, in terms of men coming back, uh, uh, coming back through as two-week wait referrals in prostate cancer than other specialities. OK, thanks, Mark. Uh, Patrick? Thanks, William. I, th I think the question for me is what, what's what's the purpose of reporting data to this particular group? 
And if we're clear on that, then we might be able to determine what data we then decide to report back to this group. I mean, personally, I think there's an element of, within which we can report back to other groups that we're involved in, other patient public groups. Um, and in which case, I think for me, what, what we want is not so much historical comparative data, but comparative data across the Cancer Alliance with the different trusts and also how we compare nationally. Um, and I think that's the sort of data we should be looking at with a view to also what then can we do as patients, as patient groups um, to try to support whatever actions are determined by an analysis of that data. Yeah, I think that's very important, Patrick. And obviously we were looking at uh, earlier discussions about comparative uh, and comparative performance. And I think that that's really very important for us as patients to understand what's going on in our local patch. So I think these generic trends are very important to understand what's going across, going on across the whole alliance. But having something more localised, I think, is also uh, relevant. Anyone else want to contribute to this? William, I was just going to make a suggestion. I think what Patrick asked is, is really helpful. Uh, hence why I think if we have that little session, it might only be one meeting outside this group to have that because we've got a really limited resource around data analytics, which is Nathan sort of near enough single handed at the moment. Um, so what we'd want to do is we produce one report for you each month, which you could all then have access to and then you could all share in your potential different yeah. forums. And we can definitely look at tumour site specific by trust, by region, and then we can benchmark that nationally. So that data is there. So if we can agree how you want it to look, um, then if we give you then at the beginning of each month for the previous month, that slide deck, then you can share it amongst, you know, you know appropriate, uh, you know, venues or sorry, appropriate meetings, because we can't have ad hoc requests because we are very limited in terms of our resource. Well, okay. Kathy, Thank thanks you. again for that, that offer of the meeting. I think it might be helpful, uh, particularly I think, Patrick, with your past experience, if you were able to participate and obviously what's going to be a one off meeting, I think that would be very helpful. So we, we will we'll follow up on a, on arranging that. Okay, yeah. any... So, William, thank you. Thank thanks, you. Kathy. Anyone else got anything else to contribute to this? OK, move on then to agenda. Thanks again, Nathan. No, no worries. Thanks everyone for your comments. I've taken down notes. Uh, Shelley and Thanks, Lisa, over to you. Welcome, Thanks, Shelley. William. Thanks, William. Um, so I just wanted to say that the majority of this agenda item has been sort of put to for a discussion up about our sort of joint Macmillan and TVCA engagement strategy, but conscious that Macmillan haven't been able, with a clash of meetings, to actually present initially to our PPG group members, um, Shelley very kindly has come along and she's going to give an overview initially about what Macmillan, um, what Macmillan does and give a, an update for December. And then obviously we'll go into talking about sort of the engagement strategy work that we'd like the, the group to get involved in going forward. So I'm happy to direct the slide, Shelley, if um, as and when you just give me some direction. So there you go. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so as Lisa said, I'm Shelley Orton. For um, those of you who don't know me, I'm the Strategic Partnership Manager for Macmillan in the Thames Valley region. Um, unfortunately, we've had a clash of meetings this year, so hopefully next year um, our engagement leads um, will be able to um, participate in this meeting going forward. Um, if, next slide, please, Lisa. So um, we can share these slides with the group afterwards. Um, I've just put the local team up there just so people have got contact details. Some of you may know Chris Cower um, and um, who is our engagement lead for Berkshire West, Buckinghamshire and Milton Keynes. And um, recently Emma Dowie has joined the team and she covers um, Oxfordshire and Swindon. So um, we'll hopefully be meeting a lot of you going forward. Um, I'm aware that's a long list of um, different job titles. So um, next slide, please. Um, I've just run through just a bit of explanation of what the different members of the team do. So um, our engagement leads, they're there to make those links between um, Macmillan and the local communities, um, uh, both people living with and affected by cancer um, and ensuring their voice is heard. So they provide a lot of support for support groups um, and um, 
other groups as well and try to provide that connection with some of our Macmillan professionals and services um, to make sure that there is that co-production there. Our quality leads link in with our Macmillan professionals. So um, when we talk about Macmillan professionals, that might be that doesn't just include nurses, it can be allied healthcare professionals, can be some of our volunteer managers, um, information and support teams, um, lots of different roles that we would include in that. And that includes both posts that we're funding. Um, so as um, Vicky mentioned, the primary care facilitator posts, we've um, helped to support those along with the ICB, um, but also previously funded posts and um, what we call legacy professionals. So there's around 500 Macmillan professionals across Thames Valley currently. So our quality leads help to support them. And I'll talk a little bit about what they do in a minute. Our partnership managers work with the um, different organisations across the area to look at where we might invest or where we can support services. And, uh, and my role is to take that sort of more strategic overarching view um, and also how we can influence um, strategies that are developed locally. Um, this is just a, an overview of our strategy. Um, and you'll see that number six reflects um, speaks to the fact that we want services to reflect the communities that they serve so we um, try to do that through the work that we do locally but also through the information that we provide and making sure that that's accessible um, across a broad range of different communication uh, forms. Uh, next slide please Lisa. So this is just a bit of an overview of what our strategic focus is currently uh, where we're pro providing support. Um, one of the key areas is around information and support. We know that the information um, centres across the region obviously have had to transition into different ways of working over the last couple of years. So it's how we can support them to ensure that they're reaching patients um, as best as possible. Um, personalised care and, and care planning refers to um, that holistic uh, what matters to me conversations, whether that's through holistic needs assessments or cancer care reviews. Um, and as you've talked about in terms of that um, challenge around that integration across the system, so making sure that primary care and secondary care um, communicate across so that, you know, people aren't having to retell the, the same uh, message to different professionals. Um, money and work, we support local citizens advice um, advisors and obviously that that's a huge area um, that has increased considerably at the moment in terms of support needed. Um, psychological support, we've um, been working with the Alliance on the psychological support scoping project, um, which some of you may be aware of, um, to try and understand where the gaps are currently and what further support is needed in that um, crucial area and making sure that that is seen um, as equal part of cancer care delivery um, as treatment. So and the other area is end of life care support, looking again at um, how those services can be developed going forward. Um, next slide, please, Lisa. So um, as I've mentioned, we've got a large number of professionals across the region um, and what we're doing next year is trying to improve the offer that we've got for those professionals that has reduced over the last couple of years, but we've tried to increase that again. Um, so this is just um, speaking to that, that we are trying to make that more um, formal next year. Next slide, Lisa. So this is just um, to mention that one of the key things that we're doing with professionals is helping to them to review and think about the quality of their service. We know that everybody's, as we've said, extremely pressured and under um, a lot of work, um, but enabling them to kind of take that time and look at thinking how they develop their services going forward. And as you can see, the first part of that is um, how they include people affected by cancer in their service development. And behind each of those statements is um, some key prompts around that it's not just a tick box exercise that, you know, how is that, you know, formally done and how is that integrated in, in what they're delivering? And equally, how are they involving um, people affected by cancer across the um, wide demographic in their region, so um, making sure that they um, are speaking to um, all of the users of their service rather than um, just um, 
select numbers. So that's something that we're really keen to encourage, and that's sort of also why we're talking about the strategy today. Um, next slide, Lisa. So this is just an example of one of the resources that we can signpost um, services and people to. And um, we developed a raising your voice toolkit, and um, I'm not sure if anyone's aware of that, but um, that's available to patients in terms of gives them advice on how they can raise their voice around their own cancer treatment and and what they should be receiving. So happy to share that full toolkit with the group. Um, I've just included some slides in here and I won't talk too much about them, but they're just around what our um, actual direct services are um, for people affected by cancer. So people may be aware of our website. We've also got specific support around work and financial support um, and also our nurse helpline, which is open seven days a week. And next slide, please. Um, we've also got our online community, um, which people um, may find more appropriate rather than telephone. Uh, we've also do tailored information by email and post. And we've got our Macmillan Buddy service, which went to a telephone service during the pandemic, but has gone back to a face to face service as well. And we also can um, refer people to specialist counselling um, through our partnership with Bupa. Um, next slide, please. Um, and this is just to say, as I mentioned, trying to make sure that everything that we do provide is, is accessible. So we do it in various languages. We can arrange translation through the support line. We've got a new service for um, around British Sign Language so that providing buddies for deaf patients so that that provide extra support for them. We've also got um, a range of different resources in terms of easy read and audio books, et cetera, as well as different print and text relay. Uh, next slide. And also just to mention our partnership with Boots. We have Boots information pharmacists across um, all of the UK. There's over 4,000 information pharmacists out there and you can find out uh, via their website where your local information pharmacist is. We've also trained um, 2,000 pharmacists on end of life care as well, so that they are better um, prepared in terms of supporting people um, and their loved ones at end of life care. And also our beauty advisors within um, a lot of stores as well, who can also see people by video and online. Also wanted to mention our support grant. So we offer a support grant of up to £15,000, which can be available to support groups and community groups. And um, this can be used for setting up a new support group or if a support group wants to do a particular um, increase their information or look at website development or things like that, we can do a one off grant um, for that that purpose. So Chris and Emma can support people with that. And also we have our direct patient grants. I've just included um, our links on a separate page um, in case anybody wants those because the links on the previous slide won't work directly. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of a whistle stop tour of, of what we can do both locally and nationally. Um, so if anyone's got any questions and then we can lead on to the, the strategy. Um, I think it's just important to say that um, Lisa and I and Chris have been um, very keen to kind of think about making sure there's an overarching strategy for the Alliance. It's more a case of we know that there's lots of really good practice in across the region around patient engagement and it was what we wanted to do was kind of bring something together so that all of that information was in one place both for services within the region to so that there's that standard of best practice but also for people who want to get involved so that they can have um, more of an understanding of the different ways that they can get involved. So, okay, thanks Sherry. Any initial questions then for Sherry? Uh, on the services before we get into talking about the engagement strategy. Peter. Yes, thank you, William. I'd like to congratulate Shelley on an excellent uh, presentation. And um, I just note that for um, um, developing our professionals, that there are government grants available for um, teaching English as a foreign language. Um, I'm supporting a, a, a group of both Ukrainians and people from Hong Kong. Um, in that, uh, that in professional endeavour. And uh, I'd also point out that the government warm spaces um, spaces scheme, that, sh that should be um, 
producing an excellent source of um, um, venues for us to reach out to patients. Thank you. OK, thanks, Peter. Okay. Anyone else got any points for Shelley before we move on to? Uh, yes, Jeff Newton. Oh, hello there. Um, sorry I was late. I'd just like to ask Shelley about the Macmillan bus that they used to have. Is that operating anywhere now? Because it was very useful going into, I was going to say, deprived areas and patients helping on the van to speak to um, people just going about their business. Okay, it was very you. popular. Okay, Shelley. Yeah, um, uh, nice to um, hear you, Jeff. Um, long time no see. But um, so uh, unfortunately, yeah, uh, as you say, the Macmillan buses were a, you know, a brilliant resource that we had previously. Um, we had one for each geographical region, so one that covered the entire southwest. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the decision was made dur during the pandemic that we um, stopped the bus service. Um, unfortunately, as, as, as brilliant as it is um, in terms of the, the cost that it takes to run and deliver the service um, and, and, and thinking about how many people that it actually reaches, it wasn't um, decided. It was decided at that time that that service um, wasn't going to be continued. Um, it's interesting. There's been a lot of feedback around that and a lot of people do really miss those buses. I think it's something that will be reviewed in the future as to different ways that we can deliver similar services. But unfortunately, we don't have any plans at the moment. OK, thanks, Shelley. Kath? It was a general question, actually, which is how and when did newly diagnosed patients, generally speaking in hospital, learn of Macmillan and their services? Um, because it's a little, it's a few years since my husband was diagnosed. Um, so I'm just intrigued as to whether things, what, no, I can't say whether things have changed, whether um, it's a, you know, set rule, you know, you, you will see a Macmillan nurse within X number of time of being diagnosed. Is there such a thing as a policy or procedure? Um, no, there's not. I think um, one of the um, what we have is, as I mentioned, we do have a large number of Macmillan professionals across the, the region, but not all cancer professionals are Macmillan. Um, and um, so, you know, everybody will meet a CNS and I'm sure Mark would speak to you know, to that in terms of, you know, that is a standard that we you know everybody who does want to make sure happens. Not all of those CNSs will be Macmillan, but what we're aiming to do with our um, professional offer next year is that although not all members of a team will be Macmillan, we will support the whole team. So making sure that that offer and that that knowledge is out there. We've had a reduced team over the last couple of years, so it's been difficult to get those messages out and across. And that's what we're aiming to improve so that everybody's got those resources there so that they can provide those resources when people are diagnosed. So um, I think it's fair to say that, you know, it's always a challenge to get that information out there, but that's something that we're striving to do to make sure that that offer is available um, and that people can be signposted. Obviously, a lot of what we do complements what exists in the um, in the trusts already and what CNSs are providing. Um, and, you know, it's not to replace that in, in any way. It's more of a compliment. So um, it's trying to get that message out and the resources out there as much as we can. Yeah, yeah. And I certainly, yeah I, thank you. And I certainly understand, you know, CNSs are generally the first port of call. But going on slightly um, further ahead then to holistic needs and, cre and the um, cancer reviews, is, is that still your role with Macmillan within the hospital or is it a joint? Because that's something that we've talked about before, about it being improved or being done or being done at a different time for the patient. Well, what's the situation with those two areas or one in the same? Thank you. OK, thanks, Kath. So I think in terms, again, it's something that we work jointly with. So um, we work with the teams across the region. Um, it is our main, one of our main priorities and it remains so in terms of making sure that people have access to that um, holistic conversation, whether that be a holistic needs assessment or a cancer care review um, uh, throughout their 
their pathway. So um, what we're trying to do is work with professionals as much as we can in order to support them to implement that, because at the end of the day, um, it is the professionals who will be delivering those holistic needs assessments and cancer care reviews. So I don't know, probably Lyndall and Mark would probably want to, and Hannah might want to comment on how that works in, in reality. But um, as I say, our aim is to try and produce as much resources and training and support as possible to facilitate that um, and to work with teams in helping them to, to implement that as, as throughout their services. But equally, both um, Chris and Emma are doing a lot of work and a lot of work is being done nationally um, in terms of working with patient groups and that understanding of personalised care offer and how we can improve that offer as well. Okay, thanks, Cathy. Lyndall, you've been willing to come in. I was just going to say for Cathy, um, so all patients should meet somebody um, at the time of diagnosis. But whether that's a Macmillan CNS or a CNS funded by the trust, Macmillan have been amazing and have supported cancer services uh, across the country hugely with staffing. And I don't think any of the services I've been involved in could have been um, as well developed if it hadn't been for uh, Macmillan funding to support a lot of that. But um, a lot of the nurses are also funded by the trust or potentially other charities as well. So the importance is about meeting a CNS um, and having those contact details. But certainly all of the Macmillan information is usually the standard sort of information that trusts will use with um, sharing information on different cancers, different types of treatment. And so that sort of information will be signposted by the CNS. When it comes to um, personalised care and doing the HNA, again, it's the CNS that will you know, initiate that, usually around the time of diagnosis. Um, that can be up to sort of six to eight weeks post um, diagnosis. And then um, approximately six months or after the, the treatment has been completed. So that's where the TVCA Personalised Care Forum will have uh, representation from each of the trusts to actually talk about how they're progressing with that work um, across each of the tumour sites. So certainly so it's still work to be done, but the, the CNS takes a key um, element in that. And then there's also um, some support worker roles that have also helped facilitate some of that um, personalised care work that's being done. OK, that's thank you. Brief response. OK, Nikki, you want to come in? Yes, yeah, so um, I was just going to say that uh, the post that I've been in for the last 18 months has been all about helping all the different CNS teams to embed holistic needs assessments um, and, you know, to improve the quality of the assessments that we do for our patients. So I have seen a definite um, improvement in uptake of HNAs for patients because of the training and the way that the CNSs now um, offer patients the chance to complete HNA. So there's there's been a lot of input and um, support from Macmillan um, and Thames Valley Cancer Alliance. Um, and I know I'm not the only person in a post like this. So there is a huge push um, and there's a lot of, um, well, cross um, organisational working going on. So um, definitely lots of improvement. Um, yeah, and more posts like mine, I think, you know, will will help. Um, but obviously there's massive pressure on money and resources. So, but we're getting somewhere. OK, thanks, Nikki. Let's move on then to the next part, which is the engagement strategy. Uh, Lisa, you're going to lead in this? Lovely. Thanks, William. So um, although we've got a terms of reference for our PPG group, we actually do obviously linking with quite a few external um, external groups with our external patient engagement. I, I thought it would be easy just to kind of show, I think I've possibly shown this diagram before of all of the kind of um, links that we have all sort of feeding in, feeding out to our PPG. So one of the National Cancer Programme delivery principles for 22-23 is understanding and improving experience of care by embedding you know that patient voice that patient carer um, and public voice into the policies and service development and delivery excuse my croaky voice <coughs> 
So we have we there was le there's a legal statutory duty which I mentioned I think in the September meeting about involving patients and the public in the work that we do. And each alliance has to have a nominated cancer alliance patient engagement lead like myself and an involvement strategy to obviously support how things are taken forward. So between Shelley, myself and Chris, we thought it'd be useful to pull together some information that we already know around involvement. And as Shelley was saying, it's literally just laying the foundation initially, um, but we really want this group to kind of build upon it. So we, we totally understand and obviously want co-production to be an essential part of the development of this document. I've already shared the draft of it. It was circulated with the papers. So I really hope that you've had an opportunity to review it. And I was hoping that we would be able to hand over quite a significant time in the meeting today to, to go through it and to see if there's sort of some areas that we've obviously missed and that need included, if the information was helpful and just to kind of get your feedback. Um, for those that haven't been able to maybe have a, a chance to read it, it's been split into a number of different sort of um, headings. Um, intro and background to obviously Macmillan and ourselves, um, what our role roles are and what our relationships are, what opportunities they are for involvement um, across the patch and the best practice and elements around how we recruit and how we train our patient reps in taking that forward, as well as touching upon various different templates and governance and risks that obviously patient involvement um, need, needs to be supported by. So I'm really mindful of time, though, because we were hoping that we would have been able to give us sort of a good half an hour over to this discussion. It may well be that perhaps we can shorten some of the other agenda items, but um, William, just to kind of flag on the on the time of this. So yeah, I think I think it's important. Let's let's sort of take a bit more time. We'll see how we go with the rest of the agenda. Okay. Uh, so if anyone who's had a, a chance to have a, a quick look through the document wants to give any kind of immediate feedback, Anyone got, uh, Peter, you got your hand up? Yes, thank you, William. Uh, I'd like to congratulate Lisa on an excellent piece of work. She's identified further areas for development um, and uh, she's, uh, I will send her my, um, I will send her a, um, a number of um, comments to directly. So okay, yes, thank you. excellent work. Thank you, Lisa. Well, thank you, Patrick. Hi, thanks, William. It's, I have read it in detail, but it's difficult to comment on because I'm not clear what the purpose of the document is and who the intended audience is, because it's it's only within that context that I think I can reasonably comment on, on what I think we should do with it. And I think particularly who's the intended audience? OK, thanks, Patrick. Lisa, do you want to go back on that? So thank you. Thank you, Patrick. So initially, when anybody joins the um, our PPG or the TVCA to obviously support activities within the region, we send them a welcome pack as well. You know, um, Patrick, because you've obviously had great involvement in, in pulling that together. But this was just more kind of an, a wider overview, a wider over, uh, strategy of why patient involvement is important. Now, I'm aware that linked to this, there will be a sort of going forward doing document. And that's sort of looking at the delivery plan of how we kind of actually on a month to month, year to year, um, you know, get patient in, engagement embedded. So I think we just initially, it's very draft, we can pull it apart and we can create something different. But Shelley and I just thought, let's pull all the information together that we have at the moment, part of which is obviously included in the welcome pack that we share with patients, but also partly that there has to be an overarching strategy for us. Um, so I guess in a way, what would be useful, let me push that back, what would be useful for this document to be? What sort of audience do you think that it would be useful to be shared with? I mean, I think personally, it's, and any documents that we're putting out on, on patient care or public engagement and involvement should be accessible to the public, to people who either are already engaged or have just become engaged or who might be thinking about getting engaged. Um, so I, I think for me, there's there's a big issue with it in terms of accessibility and readability, um, because I think as it stands, um, it's it's I think it's it's readability is quite inaccessible. I think it's far too high a level of readability. I think in terms of access, the language used, 
there's very, very long sentences. There's a lot of jargon. Um, there's a lot of acronyms that are used without um, explanation. I don't. I think it misses a really crucial point. I, I think the, the first subheading is brilliant, making every cancer voice count. But nowhere in the document does it really clarify exactly what we mean by patient care or public engagement and involvement. And I think throughout the document, there's an awful lot of um, sort of assumptions made. And I think, if anything, um, I've got to be honest, if, if I receive this having just decided to possibly volunteer, it's more likely to put me off than enthuse me and encourage me. And I think it should have an element of, of engagement, of enthusiasm. Um, I should be reading this and thinking, wow, this is something I really want to do because it will make a difference. And I, if I'm honest, I think it's totally lacking in that element. Um, I, I think it's almost like a, a document. It's a work document that you'd get in a professional uh, context, to be honest, rather than a document that you'd receive. Um, as a volunteer, somebody who's hopefully enthused and engaged in trying to make a difference uh, to cancer patients and their families. And I think it misses that thread completely, if I'm honest. Okay, thanks, thanks so, for the honesty. I think it's been very important. Shelley, let me bring you in at this point. Shelley? Thank you. Um, I th you know, absolutely take those points on board. I think what we are aiming for is an overarching document in terms of supporting um, as you say, there's there's two elements to this. One is that we wanted to have an overarching document that supports the organisations within the region, so that if they are, so that everybody is doing the same thing from a um, an engagement point of view, so that it's overarching. But equally, looking at then having it in different formats because there are two different audiences there, as you quite rightly say. In terms of, we want to make sure that from a best practice point of view that that is being followed across the region but equally for people who are considering being involved then we need something that is worded in and constructed in a way that speaks to as you say to encourage people into being involved and then breaking down the different options and a, the different options available to people in terms of how do you get involved, but B, what, what, what support and training should be there and available to people who want to be involved? Because, you know, it is a big, big undertaking and there needs to be the right level of support there. So I think in, in the long run, it would be two different documents, but we don't want to kind of take out the, you know, you don't want to make one that, they need to have the same content in terms of that point of view. OK, thanks, Shirley. Uh, Kat, you want to come in briefly and then try to move on? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, I, I, When I read the document through, I must admit, I did think it was quite a long, very, um, I call it management speak document, um, because that's one of the way I tend to phrase it. Um, and I thought, well, how would I help to get that patient voice and how would a patient come to us? through this and I just couldn't I couldn't get my head around it either I do I do patient public involvement in research and quite a number of the people that way that I've seen anyway come through the disease specific route so through organizations like are represented here um, and I, I do think that you have to keep it you do have to keep it simple you also have to make it easy um, and also how and where are you going to get your new people? Because it sounds simple um, going to like a, a patient and public um, involvement group at a GP practice. In reality, it's far from simple. So I think, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it is a, a, a bigger piece of work to be done, as already been said. Thank okay, you. Thanks, uh, uh, Alex. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to support what Patrick said there. Um, as an existing volunteer, I picked that up and thought, ah, this looks like something I'd really be interested in helping with. But by the time I'd finished reading it, um, I, I wasn't quite so sure. <laughs> just the complexity of it, um, okay, I okay. think, got me. OK, Lisa, okay. Lisa, you've had some shit punches there thrown on this. Absolutely. 
<laughs> and that and that's why we wanted to kind of bring it to the group. I mean, I'm mindful that it's not going to replace the welcome pack that I give because that has gone through so many different reiterations with patient involvement. But as Shelley said, we, you know, we put this in one place. If we need to split it out, that's great. But ultimately, I think my ask for the group today is I would really like to capture people's kind of comments and have a little subgroup. So some volunteers to kind of work with me to pull out elements that they think you know, would make it more appealing to a specific audience, what needs to be contained, and then maybe perhaps what needs to be more broadly um, shared for our trusts and organisations who obviously are involved in patient engagement as well, but knowing that we're linked in with them as an essential part. Okay, thanks, Lisa. Um, so a couple of final things. Sorry, Linda, you want to come in briefly? Linda? just wanted to say that uh, I'm from Milton Keynes and we're part of the Bedford, Luton and Milton Keynes ICS and we have been working on a handbook for patient reps which isn't released yet and I, I mean nothing for me to share with you but you might like to liaise with, Lisa might like to liaise with Sarah Burford or talk to Jaff and I because she's involved too about the way we're tackling it because it's it's different and it seems to be going down quite well. Obviously opinions differ as they always say but it's accessible language because we've aimed it at the man in the street. Okay thank hey, you thank very much I think that, that that's very helpful. Okay so to wind this up if I can just reinforce if people have the the individual way. comments that they want to send in writing to Lisa please do as soon as practicable. Uh, and then Lisa was asking for uh, volunteers who might be prepared to uh, be involved in the, helping to carry on with drafting this and getting it more perhaps in, in plain language. Anyone prepared to volunteer? I see a hand up, Anna. Is that Anna or Anne? Kath, are you I'm just taking mind. No, I'm not going to volunteer. I was just, I was just going to ask a question. That was all. I've just stuck my hand down. Okay, do, do, do just a moment then. Uh, yeah, no, I'll volunteer. I'll volunteer. Sorry, who's that? Kath. Oh, hi, Jeff. Okay, and uh, Debbie, also you see your hand up. Is that a volunteer? Don't know, but me too, Alex. Patrick, okay. And uh, Debbie, you've got a hand up. Is that a, a volunteer or do you want to ask anything? No. Nope. OK, so we've got a few volunteers there. Um, Jaff, is that you volunteering? It is, and I think probably Linda and I could contribute quite a lot. Um, the leaflet or the document that we're involved with, protect your voice. Yeah, and okay. um, I think we could, if only for a short time, help. OK, OK. That's so, really uh, great. I'll yeah. I'll reach out to you guys. We'll organise a kind of a little subgroup meeting and we'll take this discussion forward and then meanwhile sort of circulate other comments to me. Uh, greatly received. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. OK, thanks, everyone. Let's move on then to the next item. OK, we'll be very brief on this because I think we do need to catch up on some time. Um, this was uh, yesterday, obviously. Uh, Lindell, both Lindell and I were there. And Kathy, who has unfortunately had to, had to leave. Um, I think the first thing to say, it was certainly amazing is too strong a word, but to actually get into a room with other people involved with cancer, you know, professionals and others, and actually see them face to face all together in a room, I think was a was an amazing kind of thing after after so much time when we've been dealing with so much on, online. So I think that's the first thing I would say. We had a very um very packed agenda uh, with an awful lot of presentations, including from Shelley, uh, and a number of presentations around um, pilot um, um, events that were going on, uh, pilot projects, not pilot events. Uh, and for me, there were a, you know there were a number of number of themes coming through. The first one is obviously the obvious one: um, money. I mean, what one of the problems all often with, with, with pilot projects is they get funding for a couple of years and then not all of them uh, get followed through. Now, obviously, 
we should only be following through the ones that are successful. But sometimes even the successful ones may not get through because of you know uh, challenging with the with with ongoing funding. So I think for me that's a you know that's a a, a critical issue. There was we mentioned earlier on about uh, I think the uh, when we're talking about pathology and Derek Russell, who's the clinical director of pathology at OUH, I gave a very uh, helpful uh, presentation on again very detailed on what was going on in his field, not just focusing on Oxford, but focusing right across the region and also going into Milton Keynes as well. So there was a lot of important stuff coming out of that. And there were no, a number of other, I felt very kind of um, important presentations, including some presentations on the, the Cancer Allies uh, program, um, and one looking particularly at sort of how, how, how we need to do more in terms of reaching out in terms of minority ethnic communities. So there was an awful lot on the agenda. And I think one of the things I'd probably want to do is pick some of the key things out of that, perhaps to bring to, uh, to future meetings, because uh, I'm, I'm hoping to get copies of the slides in the near future. I think we can then, then perhaps spend a, a more dedicated time to look at some of those kind of themes and issues that are coming through. Lindell, do you want to do you want to like to add to that? Yeah, thanks, Patrick. I was just going to say I think it was really positive. We had over 100 people in the room together and it was the first time in over two years that we've actually had the opportunity of bringing staff together, which was fantastic. And there was Lindell, I'm, a, sorry, a I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we can hardly hear you. Has yeah, everybody yeah. like? Ah, there. Yeah, sorry. That's better. Um, That's better. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> So sorry, I was just saying we had over 100 people in the room. It was um, fantastic to have staff together after over two years of, you know, not being um, together meeting. Um, some great networking going on. I think that was one of the biggest things that staff got out of the day is actually talking to other colleagues, sharing contacts, information of what's been working well for them locally, what hasn't been working well. We had some good sponsors in the room as well that also helped with providing information. So we had Macmillan, Cancer Research UK, Onco and the Central and South um, Genomic Medic um, Medicine Alliance. And uh, we had some very good speakers. So we it ranged the people attending from primary to secondary care, medical staff, nursing staff, allied health professionals, along with managers, MDT coordinators. So it was fantastic to have a real mix of people in the room. And we had some good uh, speakers. There was um, excellent discussion around genomic medicine and personalised care in the future. Um, you know, there's some real challenges with getting that set up across the area with um, challenges in pathology, but then also looking at our workforce and how we'll make sure that we'll have the right staff to to do that with the right skills. Um, there was also a discussion around council workforce. Um, workforce was something that was sort of, you know, a theme in many of the, the discussions that we had, yeah. uh, but the council allies discussion was excellent. And uh, there was some great feedback of how some local community groups had worked very well um, trying to um, work with local communities, understanding signs and symptoms of cancer um, and helping to sort of raise the that sort of profile and, and asking people to sort of come forward if there's concerns. Uh, good primary care discussions around some of the initiatives that have been done through what we call Derma Drive Through, which is a, a special sort of skin cancer clinic in the community. The GPs are seeing uh, patients with potential skin cancer talking about QFIT, which is a specific test for colorectal cancer. Um, and then there was also Mark uh, gave a, a presentation that's been shared here previously about the cancer collaborative work that's been done and the translation of um, some patient information into different languages and working with the Berkshire West Cancer Champions, which was excellent. Um, and also sort of sharing where various innovative um, uh, various new innovations have come through in the Alliance. So um, 
targeted lung health check is being under, uh, undertaken by Great Western Hospital, and the Swindon community. So they were able to share a lot of learning from setting that up. And that's something that's going to be rolled out to other um, trusts and areas across the Alliance. And then in the afternoon, we had some other breakout groups as well for the staff. So the clinical leads were able to get together with Jen and myself when we were talking about work for next year. Uh, we had the primary care um, community get together talking about some of the work that they're doing, as well as the MDT coordinator. So uh, the, the feedback we had was really positive, and we're certainly going to be looking at setting another date for next year um, and bringing everyone together. Thanks, Excellent. Patrick. Oh, sorry, very, William. No, 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 no. That's a very comprehensive uh, coverage. You know, much more comprehensive than, than than my comments. Anyone want to ask any brief questions, Matt? No. Okay. Another event was going on on the same day in London, uh, which meant that uh, Lisa couldn't join us in Oxford. But uh, Lisa and is David with it as well? Okay. Hi, David. Uh, hi, over to you for a. A brief summary of this one then. Thanks. Okay, and you've got slides. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, as William was just saying, obviously we had a clash with regards to uh, a national event that was taking place in London yesterday. It was hosted by the, um, the National Cancer Programme and it was around improving mental health for people affected by cancer. It was a collaborative event between um, cancer and mental health teams with representation from each of the alliances um, up and down the country. And that included um, patients and carers, um, my role, the PPE role, um, our personalised care lead and various different clinical leads within the psychology services. So but there was various presentations given um, and overviews between um, psychological and psychosocial support services and that's a mouthful when you haven't got your teeth in properly that's for sure yesterday um, and speakers included uh, Professor Peter Johnson who's actually the National Clinical Director for Cancer as well as Callie Palmer who's the National Cancer um, Director. There was also um, presentations given by Carl Wing Giles and she's the chair of the National Public and Patient Voice Forum that um, Patrick used to be a representative on for the um, for the southeast, but she also is the CEO for the Young People's Charity Shine. So I've met up with Kainwin on a couple of occasions now, and she actually has lived experience of cancer herself, and I think her story is quite powerful. And I think you know those were within the room from a young person's perspective, um, a mum having being diagnosed with cancer literally just a couple of weeks before um, giving birth was it has been really powerful and she's she very much is sort of linking in with each of the alliances going forward to make sure that we do hear from young people's voices within our forums um, we appreciate that it's really hard for young people to kind of join our sort of ppg groups with their own sort of activities going on university etc but you know it, it is a voice that we don't have representation of within our group and it is something that you know kind of we're looking to um we're looking to sort of with her help reach out so interesting that peter obviously mentioned that earlier on today um so with regards to um the actual day itself six workshops were held i've, I've listed them here um it it was it was such an energized conference i can't tell you it was so lovely to see See all of my colleagues nationally um, in one room together, bearing in mind we've always been just, you know, on teams for the last two, two years. So it was a great opportunity for clinical leads to meet with patient and care representatives and to hear the stories um, about what services that they've kind of used that was being sort of touched upon within the event. So TVCA has undertaken a mapping project to identify services that are currently on offer to our local population and where there are gaps. And Shelley alluded to that earlier on when she was talking about uh, this mapping process. The, the, the report that will be produced will actually inform a development plan as to where the priorities are within the Thames Valley and, and what services need to be sort of broadened. Um, Luke Solomon, who sits on our um, psychological care CAG, but he's also a consultant liaison psychi psychiatrist within the Oxford um, psychological medicine team. He, he's really keen as part of this report to also incorporate two or three brief patient stories 
um, a little bit like we have the case studies hosted on our website. Um, he's really kind of keen to make sure that there's a patient element within this report rather than it just being about, you know, services and what's missing and, and what can we what, what, what can we do to improve them. So he really would like to ask. I don't know if there's anybody within this group that would like to perhaps have an opportunity to share their stories if they've had any um, experience with talking to the um, psychological therapy services and if that's something that they would be willingly open to share with Luke but if you are then by all means get in touch with myself and, and I can link you in with in, in with Luke. Um, so as um, William said yes David came, um, came along to the meeting with me or to the event with me um, for those of you that haven't met David before he's our patient representative on the personalised care forum and he was involved in um, two of the workshops and met quite a number of our um, clinical psychology leads from the Thames Valley, including Rachel Holland, who leads our um, psychological care CAG. So um, I'm just going to hand over actually now to, to David because I'd like for him to to have an opportunity to share his thoughts around the event and sort of any takeaways that he personally um has sort of thought about sort of overnight really and whether or not there's anything that this group going forward can be sort of involved in with um opportunities within those services and as i say sort of reaching out to luke to hear that broader patient voice in what we're trying to achieve okay thanks lisa david yeah i mean i'd like to say first of all i was very pleased indeed to be invited um to attend this event um, I've always been interested in uh, mental health, which I feel is a primary component of uh, my well-being and other people's well-being. Um, and during my three years of treatment, uh, this has involved lots of mental ups and downs, I'm sure you uh, can imagine. And during that time, there were some periods of despondency. Uh, so uh, Lisa's talked about uh, some of the people in the in the main session. I mean, I found the, the talk by Kane Wen to be it's, it's one of those ah moments, you know, that she says something that just rings so true with you. Um, and I saw from the reaction of the people in the audience as well, that what her, her words actually meant a lot to quite a few of the people listening. Um, two of the messages uh, that ran through the proceedings uh, that I, I picked up was a firstly, that mental health uh, challenge faced by people uh, is, li is likely to be the case for most patients. It's the default. It's not something that's an add on. Uh, and secondly, uh, a sort of a litmus test is that uh, as to whether services are effective um, to a wide range of page, uh, patients is that if you concentrate on the most needy and the vulnerable and you get them right, you're probably doing uh, reasonably OK overall. So uh, Lisa talked about the workshops. I went to two uh, workshops uh, um, sort of on my own, as it were. Um, the first one was considered uh, was was the number one you can see on the slide there uh, as concerned with integrating services um, provided through the IAP uh, um, program into the into the social um, psychosocial um, support pathway. Bit of a mouthful. Uh, this was very educational for me as my knowledge of both of these um, is still quite sketchy. Uh, some of the messages which I picked up were firstly, um, that if, if you address mental health properly, uh, then you can cut the costs, uh, overall um, health costs of cancer care. Um, and during that session, uh, we were treated to a summary of the work by the Nottingham, uh, Nottinghamshire Trust uh, that suggested that starting with what you currently do well and then work outwards is probably the most effective approach uh, rather than trying to um, focus in on what you think the greatest need is initially anyway. Um, and thirdly, that the effectiveness of psychological therapies for cancer patients is actually higher than for the control group, uh, which I found quite uh, surprising. Um, the second um, uh, workshop session uh, which I attended in the afternoon, uh, was concerned with uh, the experience of cancer care of, uh, for patients who already have a uh, pre-existing mental health uh, condition. Uh, for me, this was dominated by some amazing research conducted by um, Laura Charlesworth, 
who showed how important it is to recognize and to deal with these conditions before and during cancer treatment. Um, and also very memorable was the work of a GP, Amelia Randall, who now works with cancer patients who are particularly vulnerable as their, as their pre-existing mental health conditions prevent them or did prevent them from accessing, uh, accessing uh, care in the system. She outlined a couple of um, case histories that were extremely moving. So I found that to be, um, you know, uh, amazing. Um, so that those are my main impressions of the um, uh, uh, the meeting. I had a long chat with um, Luke Solomons, and um, uh, he was very keen to get my uh, a sort of a summary of my experience um, uh, of my treatments, etc., from a mental health perspective. So I was very um, uh, pleased indeed to be able to say that I was happy to do that. Yeah, Thank so that just much. sums it up. Yeah. Thank you very much, David. Lisa, back to you just to wrap this one up. <clears throat> yeah, so I think overall it was, it you know, it gives us a basis to work upon and the psychological care CAG are taking forward, obviously, this mapping process, the report that's due to come out. So um, an ask, I think, from the group initially is if anybody would like to share their thoughts around any of the services that they've experienced during, obviously, their the cancer diagnosis that I can feed back to Luke and make that connection. That would be that would be the first priority. And then secondly, I think it would be really important to share the report with this group. And Luke and Rachel have both said that they'd be happy to join the meeting in March going forward um, to give kind of that baseline of where we're at, what it is we're hoping to do and to see if there will be volunteers from this group to support that work going forward. Thanks a lot, Lisa. Okay, let's move on to the next item. Lisa, it's still you then about uh, this representation. You've got various things that you want people to. Sure, thank you. So um, back in back in September, we shared a summary of all of the groups that we still had gaps on with regards to patient representation. Um, you know, ideally on all of them, apart from the executive board and the delivery group, we should have more than one patient representative on them. And that's really for peer support as well as ensuring that there's also that capacity for the patient voice to be present all the time. Um, so I've shared this before. Again, you've got the PPG in the middle. The areas in red are where we're still missing uh, representation. I know within some of the CAGs, this is due to um, the clinicians, unfortunately, not being able to pick up with our patient reps who have suggested coming forward and being um, and being endorsed onto that group. Um, but I, I just wanted to really summarise very briefly kind of three or four of the main gaps that we have that I'm really keen that if we can, we have somebody volunteer to perhaps or put an expression of interest in today. So Patrick stepped down from supporting the de delivery group back in September. And sadly, we've had no expressions of interest for a replacement. Um, the the group, as we've explained before, is, is made up of several different representatives who provide clinical and operation leadership um, about, you know, delivering service change and giving advice how, as how to do so. Um, it gives an overall assurance and to our executive board and making sure that obviously the delivery plan that the TVCA have um, compiled is actually being delivered at the right pace and to the quality that it, you know high standards that, it, that is expected. The meetings are held quarterly and we've tried to coincide them with the rhythm of both the executive board meetings and these meetings because we think it's really important that whoever attends the delivery group has an opportunity to share back to this group what is widely going on across the patch, what operationally is being kind of developed. So Patrick obviously, sorry, uh, William gives an overview about the executive board. Patrick would give a over a view about the delivery group, and that's where we're still missing that gap. So, with regards to the other role that Patrick held, which was the Southeast Patient and Public Voice uh, Forum representative, Rachel Lovesey advised me yesterday that she's actually had a member of our PPG put in an expression of interest to pick up this role, and that she's she's going to sort of follow that up in due course. Um, ideally, it would have been great if we had somebody that could support both. It means there's less sort of duplication. But if we have two separate people, that's that would be, you know, equally as great. 
Um, and, you know, we, we would like for whether or not it's a member of our PPG or somebody else who takes on that, um, that more southeast wider role, again, to have an opportunity to share at this forum, uh, this group, what's happening. They meet, I think the PPV forum meets every six months, or of course at the PPG we meet every, um, every quarter. Um, one of the other key areas was the workforce steering group. So when we brought that to the uh, PPG back in September, it was a very new group. They were still to have their first meeting. They've had two meetings since, and there has been, unfortunately, again, no expressions of interest um, for that group. So their purpose is to ensure that the council workforce across the Thames Valley is fit for purpose, to deliver patient care, acting as a soundboard, to um, support and drive the workforce change. There's various different representatives similar to um, the delivery board on this group. And they, you know, they really want as part of the terms of reference that, you know, Claire shared with us to listen and consider the local community patient voice. So if anybody, you know, would like an opportunity to learn more, please obviously let me know and I can link you up with Claire. Um, but, you know, the delivery group and certainly this workforce steering group are two main areas that we're, you know, we're, we're keen to have representation on them. Okay, so if we just pause there uh, and, and let's move on to the CAGs. Uh, we, we've got uh, two that you flagged up at the beginning with, the delivery group and the workforce steering group. Uh, can I ask, first of all, is, is anyone, I don't want to put anyone under pressure and people can follow through the email after you prefer, but is there anyone sort of uh, uh, at the moment who would uh, want to express an interest? Uh, Gath, is that you? Yeah, I'm happy to look at um, them in both in a bit more detail. I need to look at which one interests me more. I come from an operational background, so um, yeah, I need I may be able to uh, lend some um, knowledge in that respect, but I want to have a look and see which is the most beneficial. Okay. Um, and also, I, uh, I'm in my patient group and have been the chair of my patient group at my practice, so that's community based more so. So I think I'd, I need to consider which one would be the best one with my skills. So okay. um, yeah, either, okay, either or, but I, I'll, I'll speak to Lisa. Yeah, yes, speak to Lisa. So, so, so that's either delivery or workforce. Is any, anyone else interested? Uh, Debbie, you've got a hand up. Is that a volunteering hand? Debbie, you're on mute. Hello. <laughs> Um, yeah, I would be interested in finding out more. Um, I'm currently volunteering with Health Watch in Swindon um, as their representative for here. So they go into a lot of community settings. So it would be good to try and find out more about that. Lovely. Debbie, I don't think we've been introduced before. So if you wouldn't mind just popping your email address into the chat, I can pick this up with you afterwards and we can maybe have a a one-to-one -one offline and find out a little bit more about what you're doing with Health Watch. Yep, that'd be good. Yep, Thank you. No okay, thanks, thanks, Debbie. Let's move on to the CAGs then, uh, Lisa. So again, just a summary of what the CAGs do. So they're mainly tumor specific. Um, we have a couple that we don't have representation on, and it. I think probably the opportunity to use this network for you to have a sort of a wider outreach if you are connected with support groups. Um, that where we have the gaps on the tumor specific sites that perhaps you could just sort of promote. Again, we've we've shared a generic patient description or expectations of what a patient role description would be. Um, and I'm happy to pick that up with anybody who's interested. OK, again, anyone who's interested, please come through afterwards unless anyone wants to volunteer now or put their name in the ring now. No, OK, let's move on then. OK, so the other thing I just wanted to touch upon was Rachel Marfleet, who I met yesterday at the national event. She is working with um, the Bucks team. She's recently just joined along with a colleague and they want to take forward a project about looking at the psychological services within Bucks. And she hasn't even really got a title at the moment about what this project will be, but she's looking for patient representatives to kind of um, right from day one, look at the co-production about what this service might look like going forward. They'll obviously use part of this mapping 
planning process and the gap analysis report that Luke's done. But she just asked me yesterday whether or not there was anybody that might be interested. It's a new pathway and for patients presenting with distress after a cancer diagnosis in primary care. Um, and if there was anybody that was on that group to either link back with myself or link with her, and I've put her contact details on this slide, um, if anybody would want to personally or knew of others in a wider sort of network capacity that might want to get involved. Um, still on sort of the Bucks theme, Michael Mulwiney, he's the lead cancer nurse at um, Buckinghamshire Healthcare Trust. He's actually looking for a patient and, or a carer rep to sit on their board a little bit like William does for us at TVCA. Um, he doesn't have any information with regards to sort of expectations other than at the moment it would be sort of a two hour meeting that they would sort of need to attend and be at sort of a, a certain level um, as a shared, uh, so as a, an equal partner was on their board. Um, but he's happy to get in contact with anybody directly. If they, if they happen to live in Buckinghamshire, that would be a bonus. Um, because obviously you're more sort of to the ground to know what those services may be. Um, but he's happy to have a conversation and pick that up with anybody that's interested. OK, again, anyone interested if they want to come back, perhaps to Lisa in the first instance. Uh, and then we've got the direct contacts uh, emails there. And if anyone wants to, uh, we can pop them in the chat as well, perhaps. Lisa. Um, does that wrap up what you want to, to deal with on this item? Yeah, and it's me again. I'm still in the chair. Keep <laughs> going, keep going. Um, and in, it's literally just to give folk advance notice. I've kind of shared these meeting, future meeting dates with William already. I often find that when we're looking at quarterly meetings, it's best to perhaps know a year in advance so that we can get such great attendance like we have done over this last year. So they're the they're the quarterly dates that we've set um, from one until three, each of them. And I was just going to ask, obviously, now that hopefully, fingers crossed, we are getting a little bit more back to normal, if perhaps we could maybe utilise the June event as a face to face event. Um, I've put Oxford question mark, but I mean, I'm quite happy if somebody um, would know of a venue that we could look at. but. It's just obviously six months down the line. It gives us plenty of time for planning. But if people would like to um, either vouch yay or nay for a face to face, that would be the first instance. But I think that would be really lovely. Yes, let's just I mean, I, I think we were talking earlier on about sort of how beneficial uh, two events that some of us have been to you know, in the last few days have, have been. And certainly I think uh, I would sort of think it would be very very positive and very helpful if we were able to actually meet together uh, physically. And obviously, if we were to do that, I think we'd have a, a bit more of an extended agenda than, than we normally have and sort of try to make it really worthwhile for people to get there. So let's just sort of uh, try and identify the the principle. Uh, let's do it this way. Is there, is there, do it negatively. Is there anyone here who would prefer not to come do a face to face meeting. If she will please, please uh, do a thumbs up. Sounds opposite, but. No. Oh, good, great. So so are people then generally feeling that they would like to have the opportunity to engage with a face to face meeting? Is that the case? I don't hear, any, hear anyone saying no. Yeah, thumbs up. Yeah, OK, great. OK. Well, that being the case, then if you want to take a note of these dates, it'll obviously be in the minutes, but you know, take a note of them and get them into your diary early. Uh, we'll come back to you with a bit more uh, detail uh, at the meeting in March about uh, a potential programme perhaps for, for June. I think we, we need to spend some time understanding what you think you would really like and benefit from within that kind of extended meeting. So we'll, yes. we'll, we'll look at how we plan that uh, over the next next few months. Um, that would be brilliant because I, you know, this PPG is about what you guys want to discuss. Obviously, we had quite a rich conversation around data earlier on. And if that's something that, you know, you're passionate about and, you know, we want to look at that in more depth in June, you know, what opportunities we have, we can obviously touch upon the engagement strategy. But we're always after agenda items from the group. I often find 
Um, I have backup with regards to content, but this is, you know, this is your meeting, whatever you would like to bring to this. So particularly for the face to face, if you want sort of separate workshop groups that we can sort of split out into, um, you know, we're, we're open to those suggestions. Oh, absolutely. And, and I mean, speaking personally, I think getting a, a balance between sort of the presentation with lots of opportunity to ask questions and doing things in a smaller group works and work very well. Anyone got any other thoughts on that before we move to ALB? No? OK, great. Any other business then? Anyone want to raise anything that we haven't already dealt with? No, don't see any hands coming up. Oh, calf, go on then. <laughs> Sorry, just just very quickly. We mentioned about the outreach to um, GP practices. I think the meeting before last, because I wasn't at the October one. Um, how how is that going? Is it is it is it going? Are we getting any further forward with getting our message through to the you know directly to GP practices? Lisa? I was going well this this particular meeting we were hoping actually for Emma Teasdale to join us from Health Watch because she's linked in um, or she's one of just um, her, her role is unique within the Health Watch parameters but she actually links in with all of the PPGs within Oxford so you probably link directly yourself Kath do you because your yeah your practice is, but it is something that's missing within sort of Berkshire and it is missing within Bucks so it's certainly something that I'd wanted for Emma to sort of share with us as to how, you know, the, the positives and the negatives, you know, of what her role is. I'm not saying that Health Watch obviously can continue to do that within the other patches, but certainly from a TVCA perspective, we have a primary care network meeting and all the information that we're sort of sharing between secondary and primary care. We come together monthly, I think it is. Is that right, Lyndall? There was one this week. Um, to talk about the, the work that TVCA are doing, the pressures within primary care and making sure that we have patient representation as well and that voice. Um, so back to your question, Kath, are you saying how are we as TVCA engaging with practices or how is the patient voice being engaged within practices, just to be clear? I think it's more of, you, you know the Twitter feed you have, and the information that you put out on the Twitter feed, it's it's more, I think I'm talking more of education of patients, is how are you using that information you're putting out on Twitter to get into GP practices of a similar nature? So where you're saying, have you had your, um, your um, cervical cancer screening, um, that type of thing, and um, well, any of, the, any of the ones you're pushing, that's one of the ones I can remember, and obviously, um, so how, how are we, how it is TCVA, uh, TVCA getting that message to patients in practices? It's, it's more population health. And then secondly, yeah, is how are you recruiting more people to do the job, volunteer job that we're actually doing? Because, and thirdly, is signposting people who get, have cancer because within the GP practice, what happens is you leave, you leave, um, well, in most cases, you will leave general practice for a period of time. You'll go to secondary care and then you'll come back to primary care. So it's it's sort of those various interactions at the various stages. How How is that being managed with the GP practice as well? I, I've heard lots of good things today and I hope that it's going on, but in my experience with my husband and it is a little while ago now it didn't happen so i think I, I i would like to know you know are those reviews starting to happen for people when they should happen when they've left um secondary care do it, it it's a yeah it, it's the what's happening in the gp end really in all sorts of facets Thank you. There's clearly a huge variation in terms of what the engagement is with local uh, PPG groups of GPs. So, um, uh, Lisa, do you want to come back on that? Uh? I think the last point that Kath was mentioning was pertaining to the cancer care review. So once a patient has obviously um, left secondary care, are they being picked up back in primary care? Is that right, Kath? 
Yeah, that's what I have a distinct concern about, particularly now that GPs are so, so pushed. Something has to give. I know the medication reviews didn't happen for quite a long while. So, so I think it's, yeah, making sure that what we're saying we think is happening from the patient end is actually happening and, and getting back that patient voice to know. And, and go, going on to Emma, yes, Emma's doing a great job, but there's again a but. A lot of the PPGs, certainly in Oxford City, which mine is one of, have very, very few members. So they're not a very good representation of any services, let alone cancer services. So I think don't count them in as a big proportion of it because unfortunately I don't feel they will be. Okay, thanks. Uh, Linda, do you want to come in? Um, I was just going to say, I think there's so Lisa was right there was a primary care network meeting uh, this last week and Anant Sachdev who's one of our GPs in the alliance who leads on primary care and early diagnosis work sort of chairs that meeting that's for practices across the Bob ICS but you're right a lot of this is around population health and screening sort of sits with um, sort of other teams but they have various mechanisms each practice is doing sort of different things of how they'll um, engage with their community and actually yesterday the Cats allies bit there was um, discussion about how one of the practices is doing something specific around learning disabilities and there's so different teams are doing different um, pieces of work to try and uh, reach uh, different populations um, and trying to encourage people to come forward. And then in the personalised care bit, um, I think there's, it's been touched on today that Macmillan have funded uh, some new roles and that is trying to have sort of primary care, secondary care sort of working together and supporting um, those cancer care reviews and having the right information and coding and bits on the system. But like all of these things, I suppose, um, it is sort of evolving, but you know, potentially we could ask Anant to come along to uh, one of these meetings and talk a little bit about that sort of primary care and interaction. You know, one of the things that we're doing is looking at a specific um, education or training day for what we call um, additional roles reimbursement scheme, ours roles, and that's where potentially um, other healthcare professionals like paramedics might be doing. Um, some of the GP roles, but doing specific cancer education to try and support them with how they're identifying, um, doing two week waits, doing cancer care reviews, etc. And Anant has done some um, very good work in that area. So it, it's an evolving situation to try and support. Um, okay, and have thanks, thanks, Janet, do you want to come in? Janet, are you there? Janet, you there? I am now. Sorry right, about okay. that. All right, the right. brain's not working very well today. Um, <laughs> yes, can I just say that I do concur with what Kath's saying. Um, I have myself been involved with PPGs at, um, uh, at the GP level. Um, and unfortunately, it is very difficult to, to engage, quite honestly, in lots of, lots of surgeries, I know. Um, but the thing that I want to ask about is that I, my understanding is since the new health review, uh, you know, like to England, uh, NHS England, um, I, my understanding is that there should be either within the surgery or within their group, um, a cancer specialist. And is that the person that we are dealing with or is that someone we should be dealing with? Because those reviews are not happening in most places, when I say most, certainly not in the two areas that I know, and that's Oxford and Bucks. Okay. I mean, occasionally, but there's not, not as the general. And I do understand the pressure that the GPs are under, but then, you know, I think it's, as a patient myself, it's important. Okay, thank you. Lyndall, anything, can you cast any light on that? Um, so I think there is some work going on, and that's certainly being monitored in the um, personalised care forum. And so part of that, we have primary care and secondary care representation. And, uh, you know, it's monitoring some of the data that comes through around HNAs within secondary care, but then also the cancer care review. So 
um, you know, hear your concerns that potentially it's not happening in all practices, but there's um, significant work and investment currently. Um, and Vicky, I can see in the chat, has commented that she's happy to come back to talk about some of these new roles that are going into primary care to try and support that sort of cancer care review um, going forward and who's helping. OK, thank you. And Vicky, do you want to come in? Yeah, I was just going to say, just I'd put it all in the chat about what we've done recently as well and working with Anant. Um, so, yeah, I'm totally happy to come back to the next meeting and update you because obviously they're new roles. So we, we're working with them at the moment to get them out into the GPs. So it'd be really interesting to see what they they see. But yes, we have got that data that you're talking about, about cancer care reviews. And it's Thank specifically you. about the quality as well, not just the tick box that it's been done. So that's what we'll be looking at. Thank you. I think what Vicky's just highlighted, and it was one of the things that was occurring to me uh, yesterday, is just the how critical uh, administrative support is to driving forward a lot of this stuff. Because there were certainly a lot of the um, you know professionals who were saying, you know, we did this, we did this, and things got slowed down because we didn't have this person in post or that person left. So I think it's important, it's really important not to underestimate how significant uh, administrative support is on that. So thank you very much for your contributions, Nikki, and for um, uh, the offer you've made for the future. OK, uh, does anyone have anything else that uh, they want to raise? Uh, Lisa. The only, the only thing I wanted to add is that I got a, an email from Jan. She, I wasn't expecting Jan to join the call, but Thanks, Jan, for, for sending it through anyway. So she's um she's shared a link with us about um, an organisation called Discovery, and they basically are they're a research company um, with sort of consultation projects online with patients. And she's just recently been involved in one about supporting the doctor patient sort of communication and how important it is to hear the patient voice. So I was just going to send the link to the organisation within the minutes. And if, if it is of interest to anybody, they can obviously then pick it up from there. Um, I don't know. Is, has that covered it, Jan, or is there anything else that you'd like me to add on to that? Jan, yeah, anything you want to add? No, that's fine. And thank you. I had completely forgotten that I'd sent that to you, but thank you. Yes, absolutely. OK, well, it just remains for me to thank everyone for for joining. Uh, and also to thank uh, particularly uh, 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 David and, and Shelley for their contributions to our presentations and to our work. Uh, and uh, I wish everyone a, a wonderful holidays and great Christmas and whatever else one is celebrating. Take care. Look after yourselves. Stay Thanks, warm. everyone. Take Bye. care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.